also to our uh, colleagues from UNDESA. I think I'm going to begin. Um, it's 9 o'clock. Uh, I want to say good morning to everyone joining us this morning um, or afternoon or evening, as the case may be. I hope everyone is staying safe and bearing up under the challenging circumstances. And I want to especially recognize the dedicated people of the United Nations for continuing to do their important and, and diligent work even during these trying times. Um, I want to welcome you to this virtual dialogue on SDG 17 and public-private partnerships uh, relating to COVID-19 response and recovery in the framework of the 2030 Agenda. This virtual dialogue is organized by the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UNDESA, uh, alongside the International Organization of Employers, Business Partners for Sustainable Development, and the United States Council for International Business and its All in 2020 campaign. Um, I'm Noreen Kennedy. I work with the United States Council for International Business. I'm responsible for environment, energy, and strategic international engagement there. Uh, and I am also a co-focal point for the business and industry major group to UNDESA. And I am your moderator today. Um, very first point I want to make relates to uh, housekeeping. Uh, there are some matters of virtual dialogue housekeeping that we have to bear in mind. First and foremost, please do mute and turn off your cameras until I give you the floor. Um, we have quite a number of people on the line and it'll help our acoustics uh, tremendously. Um, we will hold all questions and answers until the end of the session and we'll do that via chat box. I think most of you are now familiar with the chat box and various platforms. So please do uh, use the chat box for comments and questions and we'll take those at the very end. And then we are recording this meeting and a recording of the meeting and the PowerPoint slides will be available uh, after. Um, so for the first thing I want to do is just talk about the objective of this virtual dialogue. Uh, our first objective in holding this dialogue is to try to fill the space left when the UN ECOSOC Partnership Forum had to be rescheduled, like so many other important meetings in response to the pandemic. So we're trying to bring some content and some examples forward that are uh, particularly relevant during today's trying times. Uh, partnerships are about solidarity, and this has been a big message of the UN Secretary General. Uh, around solidarity. For us, partnerships are solidarity in practice, and we are now seeing new kinds of partnerships coming forward to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, we do see an incredibly important role for the United Nations in that regard in crowding in such partnerships. Um, in our view, there is no contradiction and indeed a, a great synergy across all SDG cooperative implementation to respond to this pandemic. We don't have to choose between COVID-19 response uh, and uh, uh, delivering the 2030 agenda. And this is absolutely key to the decade of action. So uh, we will hear some great examples of partnerships in the course of this webinar. But before we do that, um, we're going to call on uh, some very important people to get us started and to set the tone. Uh, you see our agenda here. Um, we will hear uh, partnerships after we hear our lead off speakers Q&A at the end and then the closing session. Um, but without any further ado, I want to call on um, His Excellency Ambassador Munir Akram, who is Vice President of the UN Economic and Social Council and also the permanent representative of Pakistan to the United Nations. Uh, our thanks to you for joining us at this busy time. And Mr. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me and see me. Uh, I'm very happy to join this uh, virtual dialogue on SDG 17 and public-private uh, uh, partnerships, uh, where our focus obviously today is on the COVID-19 uh, crisis and the response and recovery uh, in the framework of the 2030 Agenda. Uh, this is, uh, as we all know, this is an unprecedented crisis. Uh, the world has not seen anything like this uh, for the past 100 years, uh, at least. Uh, and this crisis um, is both a health uh, and economic crisis. It is, above all, a human crisis. Uh, 
The virus has stretched health systems of even the most advanced nations to breaking point, and it is likely to overwhelm the underfunded health infrastructure of the developing countries. This virus, however, also has conveyed the essential unity of humankind. It cannot be defeated anywhere if it is not defeated everywhere. And we will be as strong in responding to this crisis as the weakest health system uh, among nations. The world economy, uh, as we know, after a uh, thousand, a uh, hundred thousand lives have been lost, millions have been infected, and half the world's population is in lockdown, the world economy has also been frozen. World GDP is projected to decline by between five to 10%. This recession is likely to, will likely to be worse than the Great Depression of the, of the last century. 2.7 billion workers are affected, that is 81% of the global workforce. And the pandemic has highlighted and exacerbated the essential inequalities among and within nations. As always, the impact of this twin crisis will be the most severe on the poorest countries and on the poorest people and those who are most vulnerable, uh, migrants, disabled, women, children, they will be unable to cope with the spread of the virus without help, help in the provision of medicines, equipment, and technical support. In the developing countries, the economic impact of the virus has arrived even before the virus. As nations have sealed their borders, trade has been frozen, supply chains disrupted. The fragile economies of the developing countries, which have seen financial outflows of over 95 billion over the last three months, and which are burdened by large debt, face a real prospect of an economic and social meltdown. Uh, the poorest in these countries, daily wage earners and migrant workers, will be unable to feed their families if the economic crisis expands further. Food riots, looting, and chaos uh, are not impossibilities in such an environment. These countries, therefore, must be provided with these with the basic to sustain their populations uh, through cash transfers and other means of assistance. Uh, our strategy to deal with this crisis needs to be multi-pronged. First of all, we need the political will among nations and, and the private sector to cooperate. Cooperation among states directed first and foremost uh, to deal with the health emergency. People's lives obviously matter the most. Uh, health spending must go up in order to meet the requirements of both the developed and developing countries. Secondly, we need to mitigate the social and economic impact of this crisis. Uh, developing countries uh, depend on financial support. They will, their dependence will increase, and therefore they must be provided with some form of debt relief and, and, and financial support in order to be able to deal with the twin health and economic crisis. And thirdly, we need to build, build back, as they say, build back better. That is, build back so that we can stay on track for the achievement of the sustainable development goals. The role of the private sector 
in this context and in the strategy is obviously indispensable. Uh, the private sector itself has been uh, the most affected in terms of the impact on businesses, um, on workers, uh, employment, uh, production, uh, uh, and uh, the world supply chains. And therefore, uh, the private sector will have to be part of the solution, the solution uh, that is promoted firstly at the local level, uh, secondly, in terms of international cooperation in, in science and technology, exchange of information and data in order to deal with the emergency, and in building the response and recovery from this emergency. Lastly, this crisis has crystallized uh, <laughs> the indispensable and important role of the UN system. The emergency phase is being led by the WHO and all the international agencies of the UN system have come into play in a coordinated effort. And this coordinated effort has been undertaken at the local level through the UN resident coordinator system. Uh, it is being undertaken at the regional level through regional organizations, and it is being undertaken at the global level through the UN Secretary General's Humanitarian Appeal, the Response and Recovery Fund that has been established, and the coordinated work that has been done by the IMF, the World Bank, uh, and the Group of 20 in responding to the financial needs and support systems that are required by the developing countries. Uh, at the recovery level, the larger role will emerge of the IFIs, uh, the, that is the World Bank, the IMF, the regional banks. Uh, and in this context, the private sector will need to play an important role. A large part of the fiscal difficulties facing developing countries arise from debt that is owed to the private sector. And the G20 has called for a response from the private sector uh, to, to the problems that need to be addressed in, in the developing countries to enable them to recover from, from this crisis. Uh, at the stage, uh, at each stage of the strategy, that is the emergency phase, the recovery phase, and the development phase, which will follow, we hope, to bring us back to the 2030, 2030 agenda. Uh, the United Nations system will play a vital role. And within that system, the Economic and Social Council, uh, which has the coordinating and policy role, uh, will have to play a very essential and central role in coordinated responses to the crisis from both the public and the private sectors. So the Economic and Social Council will look for cooperation look for support and the participation of all stakeholders, including the private sector, in the emergency recovery and rebuild phase uh, of this uh, huge crisis that the world is facing and which is literally consuming the nations and peoples of the world. I thank you and I wish you all the best for this time. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Ikasak, Vice President, for those uh, important remarks, for your dedication, and for calling on the private sector. Um, we'll turn now to um, Assistant Secretary General Elliot Harris, also Chief Economist of the United Nations, to offer um, his remarks at the beginning of this virtual dialogue. Uh, Elliot, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Noreen, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who've joined us on this webinar. Uh, as the ambassador said, the COVID-19 crisis is first and foremost a global human crisis. It's the first of its kind in the 75-year history of the United Nations, and easily the worst global health crisis of the last 100 years. This pandemic has brought the world to a standstill. More than 3 million people have already been affected with the coronavirus, and we have very uh, 
we, we have cause to, to mourn the loss of over 200,000 people worldwide already, with the numbers rising by the day. But it is also a crisis that has spread over into the economy. As the International Labour Organization points out, full or partial lockdown measures are in place, affecting 81%, that's four out of every five workers around the world. And the world could lose as much as 3.4 trillion US dollars in income by the end of the year. That is a very conservative estimate. All nations, all countries, all stakeholders have to rise to the challenge. First, to save lives. Second, to halt the economic and social decline. And third, to build back better together for people and for the planet. This is the core of a message that the Secretary General has given in the three-point call for action that he recently issued in response to the pandemic. The first step is to take coordinated action at the global level to suppress the virus, including by supporting those health systems in countries that are most at risk of being overwhelmed. Secondly, we need to undertake a comprehensive response to tackle the devastating social economic consequences that the virus is creating around the world with a focus on the most vulnerable countries and people. Among other things, this will require a global stimulus package of unprecedented proportions to restore sustainable growth and to safeguard people's livelihoods. And thirdly, we need to make sure that we rebuild our societies better and ensure that they are both more sustainable and more resilient. The 2030 Agenda with the 17 SDGs as its core, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and the Addis Ababa Action Agenda are our roadmaps to follow on the road to recovery, and their commitments should be respected by governments and by all other actors alike. But governments alone cannot meet the unprecedented challenges that the world is facing, both now and in the years to come. We need leadership from both the public and the private sectors to align business and finance with sustainable development. The private sector is an indispensable partner as it can provide significant financial, technological, and knowledge resources as Ambassador Akram has just pointed out. <clears throat> we need the private sector to partner and cooperate closely with governments to find solutions to the strains on global supply chains that have been caused by this pandemic. Private companies can also play a vital role in supporting the efforts of the national health authorities. For instance, we have already seen firms around the world repurposing their facilities in support of emergency response efforts and aligning their business plans with national priorities. The engagement of the private sector in harnessing emerging technologies for crisis intervention is also essential. These technologies offer tremendous opportunities to improve access to healthcare, education online, and e-commerce during this pandemic as we're constrained by the lockdowns. But the pressing need for long-term investment by the private sector, including through foreign direct investment, is especially critical in rebuilding resilient health systems and accelerating the recovery efforts. In order to improve the crisis preparedness for future shocks, the private sector should develop adequate disaster risk reduction, financing strategies, and insurance industry uh, instruments. The private sector should also make deliberate efforts to radically enhance access to finance and working capital liquidity, including for micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. Such promotion of financial inclusion can safeguard the most vulnerable populations, the poor, women, young entrepreneurs, persons with disabilities, and this includes the context of informal economies in the developing world. The Global Investors for Sustainable Development Alliance, GISD Alliance, is a case in point for the type of partnerships that will be needed as we look forward to the recovery. The GISN brings together 30 different CEOs from around the world representing institutional investors, banks, manufacturing corporate technology service providers with the intent of scaling up long-term investments for sustainable development. These Alliance members have expressed their willingness and their readiness to lead the way in accelerating the funding of sustainability in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, history shows us that global upheavals such as the current pandemic risk exacerbating inequalities that already exist. And this is a very important point that the ambassador made in his opening remarks. Avoiding a repetition of such tragedies should be at the heart of the public-private partnerships around the COVID-19 responses, with special attention to the countries and the people that are farthest left behind. 
going back to business as usual after the COVID-19 pandemic is not an option. Now, I've deliberately focused my remarks on the partnerships with the private business and financial sector. This because the centrality of active partnerships with civil society and other stakeholder organizations for the 2030 agenda is already very well established. But this crisis has underscored painfully that the role of private business and the private financial community is and must be just as central. Happily, this recognition is on hand everywhere. And that gives us good reason to look forward to a recovery that puts us on a path towards sustainable growth and that steps up the pace of the necessary change. We hope that today's webinar gives us an opportunity to take a closer look at how the public and the private sectors could collaborate better in the post-COVID-19 real economy in support of sustainable development. I wish us all a very productive discussion and I thank you all. Thank you very much, Elliot, for those comprehensive and very insightful and even inspiring comments. Um, we'll definitely take them to heart. Um, I'd like to pass now to our final high-level speaker and introduce Mr. Roberto Suarez Santos, Secretary General of the International Organization of Employers, one of the co-organizers of this virtual dialogue. Roberto, the floor is yours. Thank you, Noreen. Ambassador and participants, uh, I want to thank first of all uh, USAIB and also of course UNDESA for all the support that we have received also to organize this, this exchange. Sorry, I don't know if I'm heard. I'm properly heard. Eh? Okay. Um, let me just start very quickly. I'm going to stick to, um, because I know how difficult it is to optimize time in digital in the digital era, let's put it like that. I mean, not long, not long time ago, I mean, all the debates, the global debates on the future of business, the future of work that we were attending, uh, participating, and involved in the ALO, beyond the ALO, we'll, were discussing, were on the area of how the way we may meet business, the way we work, is changing due to the technology, due to the impact of uh, technologies and also the, the famous megatrends. And there was a constant fear of massive job destruction, of profound transformation in the way we work, in the way we do business. That was in our minds, and we have an, an important debate, an important exchange, an important outcome at global level to find ways also to, to, to find the balance and to set the balance for the future. But none of us, uh, and meaning by that not just business, but also governments, international organizations, have foreseen that one of the most important disruptions that we were going to have would come from a health emergency as the one that we have now. We got disrupted and nobody was prepared for it. With entire industries required to implement extraordinary health measures, but also with entire industries also required to have lockdowns that had, of course, an impact, an important impact on health, on health of individuals, which is a priority for us, but also an impact on the production chains, on the production of service and the production of goods. And it's leading to a, to a global crisis. I think it was the ambassador who referred to not just a an employment crisis or a social crisis, but uh, a humanitarian emergency. And that we can see it in some countries which are highly dependent on global supply chains. At the same time, we are all becoming, to some extent, digital. I mean, not we forcefully have to use digital means to strengthen and to have our communication fluent enough as to provide the minimum services that we need. I have to say also that we are witnessing a situation of a crisis which is really global. I mean, we had had a financial crisis, but if a crisis is global, it's this one, because it's affecting, it's affecting developed, developing economies and all regions in different manners, but all regions that didn't happen to the same extent last time, 
And the economic shock also can be, and I, we are using words that are strong, but they, they're, they're, there is a reason to be used. Uh, we are talking about devastating effects on social and economic, not just from an economic perspective, and some people are even talking about brutal effects. No? To, to the extent, I mean, to what extent these effects or this impact will be devastating or not has to do with the capacity that we have to act jointly in partnerships for weak recovery, especially in some critical sectors. I have to say also that this is affecting not just the capacity of companies to produce, it's not just affecting the offer, it's at the same time affecting the demand side, because the fact that many individuals are confined, the, the fact also that uh, this is affecting enormously also informal economies means that there is no capacity of consumption. And that's also why the effect is much higher than we could have possible. But now the question is how we as global community, let's put it like that, can alleviate, mitigate and prevent on one side the effects of this emergency situation, but also, and that's a critical point, how can we act effectively for a quick recovery? So let me just, and I want to stick to the time that has been foreseen for us, as an introductory remark, let me tell you how we are trying to act as IOE. IOE is a global business organization with the widest private sector network representing more than 50 million companies in 150 countries in the world. We have a formal statute with the ILO, but also we are working with other um, agencies and UN partners in a, in a very uh, current manner, in a very regular manner. Uh, if, I, if we go to the, to the first slide that we have foreseen, what we have foreseen, of course, as many other organizations, is exchanges. But we don't want just to create exchanges for the sake, for the sake of just having dialogues. What we want is to identify jointly action. We had a first one on what could be a preliminary response, and I have to say that at that time we were very, very much lost in terms of what could this seems like. And we had feedback from our Chinese members and at the same time feedback from our USA members. And you could see the big difference. Also, if you also take into consideration that some of the regions like Latin America uh, and Africa are still waiting to see the, the most negative effects of this crisis, uh, you, you will see that this preliminary response is not so preliminary depending how or where you are. We have been, of course, discussing teleworking policies, but also we are trying to identify what works and what doesn't work in terms of economic measures. But we, what we see is important mobilizations of funds at national, regional, and global level. But we keep saying that that's not reaching the real economy. That's not reaching companies, especially small and medium companies. That's not reaching individuals because of some reason. There is some areas which, where we need really to work to see what works and what does not work. I think that uh, uh, Mr. Elliot, you referred to the private sector contribution to health emergency situation, which is a financial contribution, contribution sometimes, is a kind contribution in other times, and sometimes is a health and safety contribution at the workplace. That also is an area in which we, as business community, should intensify our efforts. We have also been uh, identifying what is the wide range of labor and employment measures that have been put into place. Based also on the last financial crisis, like short time, like suspension of work for a well, for a, for a special leave uh, schemes, social protection schemes, also to try and to identify to what extent some of them can be put into place in different contexts, which is not easy. We have worked also with our main trade union partners with ITU in a joint exchange, which was quite fruitful. And we are also looking to, to global trade. I mean, the effects on global supply chains are enormous, but also what we are concerned about is how this is going to lead, how this is going to lead or not to a new, new trend in, in global integration, global economic integration. There are some also voices that are talking about deglobalization. And we want to anticipate that and to see how we can uh, establish a better best, 
and basis for the future for a future trade and we are also working in this area but that has led to some outcomes and you can see them in the next slide that I have provided to you uh, if someone can change it to it and I'm not going to elaborate on that and some come in also outcomes that we will be producing but the most important thing is not these outcomes as such because that those are outcomes that many of you perhaps are already working with we want also to bring there the practical perspective of business and business organization around the world. The most important element, and that's my main message, and if we go to the next slide, that will help me also to elaborate this, is what we do together, not just as IOE. So I will, go, I will give you some examples of where we have been acting. The first thing that we did at the very beginning is IOE, as the main business voice for employment matters, we identified together with the main trade union voice areas in which we need to act better. And we sent the message precisely, we need to act better in terms of coordinated global response. And also we jointly asked to some to the global fund that has been called upon by the Secretary General of the United Nations, but also on liquidity to the real economy. And that's an important point because the workers, the workers' family, are with us on the need also to promote a good business environment, especially for small and medium companies. This was not so common before, but we need now to go beyond our and act together. And on the basis of that, we are already having some specific measures. We, we, can, we can hear you. Sorry. We have also um, worked with a specific sector, it started to work, and we have mobilized business organizations in the airline sector, in road transport, in tourism, in the hospitality sector, for a better coordinated global response. And we have already started to, to make an important call to the G20 uh, ministers of employment on that side. Very recently, and that was, I mean, during the last weeks, and we have launched an initiative which is specifically affecting to the garment sector, one of the most affected sectors globally, I would say. And that was a difficult conversation. That has led to what we call a global call for action in which we identify principles to, to support the garment industry. These principles have to do on one side to the commitment of existing order. And I can assure you that that was not an easy, that was not an easy discussion, but also the need to strengthen social protection on these countries in a sustainable manner which is the basis for a new era of global trade, I would say. And this action will also be followed up in the coming days by a specific um, uh, push, a specific push for funds mobilization to support companies, especially uh, small and medium companies, and also workers on these countries. We are also looking to identify areas with other partners, precisely on mobilization funds, but we also want to work on a more expertise with a more expertise perspective with um, ILO and we are on a daily basis working with ILO tomorrow we'll have a very intense conversation with the director general of ILO but also with other global partners um, such as the World Health Organization we are also part of the private sector platform in the World Health Organization the global compact and others. the main point now is that this is not time for division. This is not time for decoordination. SDG 17 is much more relevant than ever before. And we are ready here to, to hear also your perspectives, but especially to identify action in which we can really be effective. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Roberto, um, for your leadership, for your engagement, for your practical responses. And indeed, let me thank all of our opening speakers. They paint a picture of challenges on all fronts, some very daunting challenges um, across humanitarian, economic, and social uh, areas. Um, and it's clear that we have to not only act effectively, but we have to act together via international cooperation with and through the United Nations, engaging all stakeholders. Um, that's a very important message that uh, we will now delve into some um, practical presentations. Um, because we are short on time, I'm not going to give the uh, appropriate introductions to all of our panelists, apologies to them in advance, but you can see their names and titles uh, in the slides. Um, I think that 
My message in setting the stage for the next three mini panels are the following. First of all, that we can't take partnerships for granted. They're more important than ever, and they're not the easy option. They are very challenging, and especially now under lockdown and with all the constraints that we face. So we definitely see the United Nations as a place that can actually catalyze and facilitate partnerships. So um, these are great opportunities that we can take forward. Secondly, um, I want to observe that partnerships are inclusive multilateralism in action. Business strongly supports multilateralism, and we definitely see that with the challenges we face on COVID and more broadly in the 2030 agenda, um, we need to pursue a more inclusive approach uh, that we can build into and mainstream into the Economic and Social Council and the high-level political forum. Um, and then last but not least, innovation is really a, a, a critical consideration. Um, often when we talk about innovation in the business community, we're talking about technologies, but in this setting, we also have to look at innovation in the ways that we work together, in the ways that we identify solutions collaboratively, scale up their deployment, and make an impact. So I want to turn now to our actual practitioners, experts from intergovernmental bodies, from the business community, from academia, um, to give us some examples and ideas of, of partnerships that they have on the drawing board or underway uh, that speak to and actually provide results relating to the COVID-19 crisis in the framework of the 2030 agenda. And I want to start by calling on Dr. Scott Ratson and Mr. Charles Randolph. Um, Scott, the floor is yours. Great, um, thank you very much, Maureen. Uh, is the sound okay for everyone? At least for you, great. Okay, thanks. I'm really happy to be here today. And uh, first, I'd like to thank Ambassador Akram for the opening remarks that were quite inspiring, and also the challenges that we face. And uh, Assistant Secretary General Harris uh, for really laying the field out of the challenges and what we all need to do together. I think the theme is partnerships, and hence the title of our group is Business Partners for Sustainable Development. Uh, we initially were established last year under the guise and the interest of the Sustainable Development Goals, and clearly with the um, exigence upon us with uh, COVID-19, we have no choice uh, but to you know, rise to the uh, opportunities that present uh, and challenges that we can all work on together. So just a slide so everybody sees what Business Partners for Sustainable Development is. It's an initiative of the USCIB Foundation that concentrates on leveraging partnerships and alliances across the UN civil society and the business community aims specifically to accelerate achievement of the UN SDGs. And as I uh, mentioned here, the USCIB Foundation has been established um, since 1980, but even uh, beyond the USCIB has been engaged um, for nearly 75 years. So if I go to the next slide, please, uh, in my five minutes, I wanted to acknowledge the Secretary General's report that reminds us, and clearly we've heard this already from all three speakers, including uh, the wide remarks from, from Roberto and the IOE, uh, this is more than a health crisis. Uh, while I'm a public health physician, uh, I know that health is our common currency, and we need to rise to the, the challenge of the um, UNSG, and unfortunately, also the, uh, the reality of this virus of a, of a worldwide pandemic, like was said earlier, we've never seen in the last 100 years. So we hope to come to the aid and engage to the ultra vulnerable, millions upon the ends of people who are at least able to protect themselves, a matter of basic human solidarity and crucial for combating the virus. We all need to step up in the moment for the vulnerable. So the pandemic is, is the opportunity uh, and I have in the next few slides just to show and thank Maureen for uh, establishing the idea that this is an example of where we think we can make a difference. So the next slide please. Uh, Business must engage in a variety of ways. We must follow appropriately, engage, and lead. There's roles in all different places. One, business plays a critical role in responding to the crisis in its aftermath. The health sector may treat patients and develop a vaccine, but they cannot secure the future alone. And I'll come back to that, that a vaccine in pharmaceuticals is not enough to turn the corner alone. Employers continue to be the most trusted source. Uh, the last Edelman 10 country study in early March uh, reminds that communication from employers on coronavirus is the most credible source of information. And this uh, tests uh, across the world, not only in the 10 countries. So we need to be mindful of how we communicate and the role 
like employers play that are crucial for our workers and the public everywhere. And then finally, the important role of communication and education. This is not just a scientific answer. This is something that we need accurate information about travel bans, about quarantines, about personal protection, social distancing, all that's important. But also, how do we educate the public and policymakers and business leaders of how to work and achieve this next normal with what I'm calling a coronavirus vaccine for protected workforce and public? So go to the next slide, please. We have heard from almost everyone that uh, a vaccine is the showstopper. That's Tony Fauci's words, uh, who's the uh, National Institute of Health's lead here in the United States. David Navarro, uh, WHO Special Envoy, also is uh, proclaiming that we need a vaccine to even have a chance at getting back in the next normal. So it's unprecedented challenge. We have to develop it, and there are 130, over 130 today, of vaccines in the works. We hope that one, two, three, many of them make it, but uh, it's not simple, it's not months, it's, well, hopefully it's months, but it's certainly not gonna be less than 12 months. It's not one sector alone, and we believe, and I think all of us, uh, really the fabric of society will require effective public and private sector collaboration to restore the resilient society that can address COVID-19 and any future public health challenge that may arise. If I go to the next slide, please. You may remember that the World Health Organization in 2019 had 10 issues, pandemic preparedness was one of them, uh, or pandemics, uh, vaccine hesitancy was another one. So we have suggested to forge a coalition on global vaccine literacy uh, with the idea that vaccines, if they're the showstopper, and that's what's necessary, we need to begin now to figure out exactly what needs to be done to get, whether it's healthcare workers as the front line, transportation, whoever the important people are around the world first, but yet we hope to you know, have billions of doses going forward. So this can't be done alone. Uh, we've already begun with the uh, Wilton Park, which is a part of uh, the executive branch of the UK uh, on convening activities, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, City New University of New York, and London School of Hygiene have come together to at least point out the issue. We've begun to speak to other stakeholders, uh, intergovernmental organizations and so forth, uh, BPSD and USCIB are ready to engage, and we're, we're fortunate with the networks of the ICC and the Business Industry Advisory Council to the OECD and the International Organization of Employers. Uh, we expect to be able to link together and leverage networks of millions of um, employers, workers, and um, uh, people around the world. And then how do we do this, that if we do have to have its next normal, which I'm using the term COVID-19 free workplace, uh, we need to figure out what the future of work will require for people to be protected uh, and for society to have some confidence in the fabric of, uh, of, of health and well-being. In the final slide, uh, in my couple of minutes uh, left, or maybe seconds left, is to remind that we hope to establish this communication and education work stream so business partners for sustainable development can't do everything, right? We're not uh, in the um, uh, discovery and uh, development side, but we are in the side that we could help the social development and what the SDGs are all about. So we hope to have an inclusive working group with social media, communication agencies, and others. Uh, we hope to link uh, as appropriate as a UN DESA Partnership Accelerator, and I think a lot to Tahidin to already be speaking with us and, and engaging in a, in a meaningful way uh, with their uh, accelerator. Uh, Business Fights Poverty and others, we have partnered and done similar webinars um, to this. And let me just uh, give the last um, shout out here to Miriam Sidibe, who's a Harvard Senior Fellow uh, at the Kennedy School. Uh, and she has a, a book coming out next month on brands on a mission. She uh, is one of the founders of World Hand Washing Day. And uh, we'll be speaking a little bit later, but uh, Miriam's work, not only in Kenya and her ideas globally, uh, have some ideas that are a playbook for how businesses and brands and marketing can really be innovative. So we think we can do this together. Uh, we can't do it alone. We would like to do it together and want to thank all of you today. Uh, and let me presage Charles from WIPO uh, has some, a very exciting piece that's worked uh, very well without taking his thunder on uh, neglected tropical diseases and a similar idea or some linkage uh, with us and Business Partners for Sustainable Development could also make the promise for uh, our innovation and 
a COVID-free world at some point uh, come to fruition. So let me turn it back to you, Noreen. I goes right to Charles and thank everybody for the opportunity today. Thank you, Scott, very much. Yes, let's let's uh, turn the floor to Charles Randolph of WIPO. Charles, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you um, for the opportunity to speak today um, from here in Geneva. I just wanted to check, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Well, WIPO, um, just to, for, uh, to clarify, is really the global forum for intellectual property services, um, policy information and cooperation. We're a self-funding agency uh, of the United Nations uh, group. We actually are up to 193 now member states. And our, our mission is really to lead the development of a balanced and um, effective IP system at the international level to ensure uh, innovation and creativity, and also to ensure that it benefits all. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, today I've been asked simply to, to uh, present um, the WIPA Research Consortium as a model of public-private partnership um, that we have modeled. Um, this consortium we started in 2011 to demonstrate the, the positive role that intellectual property can play in advancing the global health agenda. And our model focused exclusively on um, R&D for the development of medicines, uh, diagnostics, and vaccines for neglected tropical diseases, malaria, and TB. And we focus on these diseases primarily because there is a lack of investment, there's a lack of market incentive for investment in most of these diseases. And so that goes to our development uh, objective as a member of the UN community and as uh, a contributor to achieving some of the sustainable development goals. To get started on this initiative, we partnered with a global public health NGO in Seattle, Washington called BioVentures for Global Health. And we enlisted eight major uh, pharmaceutical companies. Our membership also includes universities, laboratories, national institutes, it's open to virtually all. Um, it's open to institutions, not individuals in individual capacity. And the idea is that we are sharing intellectual property, be it compounds, data sets, know-how, um, even physical technologies with researchers around the world who need it. Um, this particular model, we don't invest in drug development per se. What we do is um, get the IP resources into the hands of the researchers who need it, and we're connecting people. Ideally, we would advance research in R&D in a given disease category to the point where it could be then handed off to a product development partner. So again, we're not investing uh, in the, the development itself. Uh, next slide, please. So very briefly, how the model works is um, our partner will identify complementary interests capabilities and needs among our partners. Sometimes a company will come to us and say we have X uh, amount of uh, molecules or compounds that may be of use to researchers in uh, various disease category. What we'll do then is introduce the parties and see if there's a, in, a mutual interest in collaborating. Um, within our model, no member is obligated uh, to share or collaborate. Obviously, if they join, they want to but at any given time, they're not obligated. So joining this type of a consortium doesn't obligate the participants. At any given time, a company or a university or a research institute may not have the bandwidth to do so. Um, if they agree to cooperate, they form uh, what we call a collaboration agreement. And that again is voluntary. It's private between the two parties. We don't uh, police it. In fact, we don't even see it. But what we do do is manage the uh, communications among the parties. As the research moves forward, we um, check in and ensure that key milestones are being met and we troubleshoot to try to make it as easy as possible for both parties uh, to collaborate. Uh, next slide, please. So our uh, membership, we started out, this was really an idea with this model work or NTDs, malaria and TB. We started out in 2011 with 30 members. Um, today, we're up to 147 organizations, 42 countries across six continents. Um, 
our eight companies, as you can see listed here, are really the core. They're the ones that are opening up their intellectual property libraries, um, their assets, sharing their expertise with the institutes. And, it, and it's proven um, really beneficial to all sides. Membership is free. Um, there's no cost to joining. The eight companies pay our annual fees to the BDGH, the partner in Seattle, but that's it. Membership for everyone else, completely cost-free. They simply have to agree to a set of guiding principles, and I can provide more information separately um, offline on that to anyone who's interested. But the guiding principles govern how IP uh, is shared and how new IP that's generated from the R&D uh, would be dealt with. And then next slide, please. Lastly, um, just to give you an idea of the global um, scale, since we started nine years ago, we've put together 161 collaborations. Many have run their course. At present, we have 54, 55 ongoing, and eight that are meeting key um, milestones along the product development pathway. So um, this is a model that's worked very well for us in this particular tranche, this particular slice of disease categories. It may have some relevance uh, for today's topic. Um, and at that point, I think I will um, end the presentation and turn it back over to to you, Noreen. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Scott. Um, really interesting possibilities and, and work going forward in the R&D space and in uh, hunting for the vaccines that are going to be so important to bring us out of this crisis. Um, now we're going to turn to our second mini panel and talk about um, something very different, um, micro and medium, small, and uh, the, 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 the lion's share of the business community, which are SMEs. And we have two speakers uh, in this mini panel. The first is Professor Matunzi Mdwaba, sorry Matunzi for mispronouncing your last name. He is IOE Vice President to the ILO from uh, Productivity South Africa, which he chairs. And then Mr. Wen Chan Fong, of the Handcraft and Wood Industry Association of Ho Chi Minh City. So, Matinzi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Noreen. Noreen, but that's not my presentation. There's, that's mine. Okay, so thank you, colleagues. Um, I've done this presentation on the basis that I need to keep to five minutes, which I shall do. But in doing so, I've had to give a context. And in giving a context, there are some slides, the first four slides, really, which are just to give you a background, because it would be very difficult to go into recommendations and practical steps without giving you some kind of a, an idea. So you'll see that the first one addresses dwindling productivity levels pre-existing the pandemic. Uh, I think it's important to note that the competitive score from a productivity point of view when you measure competitiveness of developing countries is below the global competitiveness frontier of a hundred. A hundred being the aggregate ideal across all factors of competitiveness. In 2019, for example, South Africa slipped to number 53 out of 63 countries. Um, in terms of the Institute of Management Development, the IMD, which is based in Geneva, um, and the rankings have been slipping. But you'll find that when you have low productivity, growth and competitiveness is also very negatively impacted in the process. So slide two, if we could move to the second slide, which is dwindling productivity levels pre-existing the pandemic. Now, again, linking to the first uh, slide, this shows you that this is due to the absence of a national productivity enhancing policy and framework and policy cohesion to expand the productive assets in an economy by investing in the skills of its people. So you have a country like South Africa that has a dual economy with one of the highest inequality rates in the world. On the one hand, a highly advanced economy that caters for a very small part um, and really probably let's say 20, 30%, but then the remainder is a very highly um, unskilled um, kind of um, number of SMMEs that go to about 
million out of the total 2.5 million SMEs in the country. So on the one and, and, and huge levels of informality, which makes life very difficult and shows stagnation and there's a struggle to transform. Third slide, please. So the recommendations for correction, um, South Africa being an example, is that it needs to emulate the productivity policies and frameworks adopted by the countries with a competitiveness score of over 70 to unlock the potential of productivity to improve competitiveness and sustain economic growth. You will see that that index needs to go up, whether you go by way of the World Economic Forum or you go by way of the IMD, you find the same challenge that you are not going to improve anything unless you've got policies and programs put in place that focus on promoting diverse job opportunities and addressing the support and protections that people need to effectively face the risks and uncertainties of a changing world of work. Next slide. You'll see that I'm going through without the detail because all these slides will be available to you. There's eight slides and all eight slides will then give you the details. Now, I talk about a necessary recalibration opportunity. And I use the word opportunity very guidedly because this crisis provides the developing countries and Africa as a continent an opportunity, for example, to adopt the ILO centenary declaration for the future of work that we, we, uh, we adopted last year, June. The declaration impresses upon countries the agency to harness the fullest potential of technological progress and productivity growth including through full and productive employment, decent work, and sustainable development, which ensures dignity, self-fulfillment, and a just sharing of benefits for all. It reaffirms the commitment to full and productive employment through macroeconomic, trade, industrial, sectoral, enterprise, and infrastructure policies that enhance innovation and productivity. Um, next slide. So we say that there's a need for collaboration. The need for collaboration comes after recalibration as well. So we are saying this crisis has given us an opportunity. Whilst we are very distant from each other, whilst we are very far away from each other, but we need to collaborate. We've called for this collaboration globally, and we are calling for this collaboration now. But the fact that Africa has a young and growing population presents an unprecedented opportunity, as opposed to an unprecedented devastation. Everybody I listen to now talks about an unprecedented devastation, and it's true health-wise, economically, but we also have a huge opportunity to spare rapid development. The crisis provides that opportunity to change very flawed structural systems and to recalibrate economies. It requires a policy mix, action, and well-targeted investment in physical and human capital to meet the demand for the future economy. And we are saying that the AU and the ILO are called upon to strengthen the capacity of the Pan-African Productivity Association, for example, to ensure vibrant institutions that, are, that remain resilient. Next slide. So when you address the impact of the pandemic providing an opportunity, we are talking about protecting of health. And I must tell you that um, the South African government and the entire African continent have been hugely exemplary in addressing the health aspects. And innovation has been amazing in coming up with new gadgets that can work in a few minutes as ventilators and testing for the, for the crisis and so on. It actually, they've, be, they've responded even better than most countries that are developed. The focus now, though, is on the repercussions of the health crisis on the economy and on the labor market as part of addressing the impact of the pandemic. This, I must say, has been very slow in spite of huge uh, stimulus packages of about 35 billion US, for example, in South Africa, which are yet to be properly unpacked. And the opportunity here is to recalibrate, as I said, the economy. In order to protect employment, it's essential to support the continuity of micro, small, medium, and large companies. Next slide. Okay, so the next one addresses the, at the local level and in the international level. It's the second last slide and I'm done. So the employer organizations are working with their technical teams, making concrete proposals to the respective governments on different fronts, seeking to contribute to alleviating the health well managed by governments, as I've already said. But on the social and economic emergency situation side, it's very worrying, very slow, very disjointed, while at the same time, employer organizations are collaborating with governments, advising member companies in business management, continuity, and survival plans. The biggest enemy I want to underline is poverty and hunger. 
bigger than the COVID-19 in our continent. The UN Food Program talks of an unprecedented hunger of historical and biblical proportions, with hunger almost doubling by the end of 2020, which threatens all the SDGs, especially one on two, poverty and on hunger. On the international level, the business community continues to emphasize the message that determined collaboration is more important than ever to minimize the health, economic, and employment impact to prepare for a strong revival. And in this, the IOE and ITUC have had huge collaborations on a call for global funds to be used, especially in um, developing countries. Last slide. The last slide talks about the immediate action, and we have five priorities that we've put there, which were outlined by the IOE and other action that is needed. One, support for companies and workers in addressing the health uh, risk of the pandemic. Two, proper access to income support and social protection. Three, flexible and non-bureaucratic access to low-cost loans to support business continuity. Four, support for employment through a range of options, including extended temporary unemployment programs. Five, minimizing the disruption of supply chains, which are critically important for the economy and employment. And lastly, the last bullet, bullet points are initiatives undertaken in partnership with the PAPA that I talked about, the Pan-African Productivity Association, in cooperation with international partners, needs now to be rapidly fast-tracked to institutionalize, enhance, and deepen productivity. And lastly, we talk about success stories that have happened pre-COVID amongst the 12 PAPA members. But now, as we have the pandemic, we are looking at a huge need to intensify these and make sure that we can be able to have a recovery. Thank you, Noreen. I tried to go as fast as I could, and I hope I didn't upset you. Thank you. No, I'm definitely not upset, and, and thank you for a very interesting presentation. I want to now pass the floor to uh, Mr. Huang. Mr. Huang, the floor is yours. Morning. Are you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. So uh, they are going to talk. The song. Very hard to hear him. We we have difficulties hearing the speaker. Can you hear me? It's very faint. Can you? Yeah, go ahead. Try, try. We can hear you, but it's faint. Okay. So uh, you know that Vietnam is uh, one of the countries, but uh, also it's not affected by COVID-19. We are country next to next to China. Talk of the COVID-19 come from, and at the beginning, the early days. Still cannot hear speaker. Uh, try the best. The, the people. So uh, the slide is two gentlemen. First is our Prime Minister, Mr. Cook, the Deputy uh, Prime Minister who take care of the medical system. You know that it's not easy to balance between the health. Even in this uh, pandemic uh, situation, at the beginning of the day, not only the, the health, but also facing a lot of questions. Vietnam is a socialist country, so we are many the country is uh, centralism and democracy. We get the news for the people, for our citizens, by the Facebook, and uh, make sure that all of the information comes to give to people in America. And uh, luckily, until today, we are we have. 270 cases, but nobody dead. So in the country, we, we say that we, we don't blame the God on this situation. Thanks for the government that protect, protect our health and protect us. Next slide, I will talk about our association. Our association is the furniture association of the Ho Chi Minh City, the biggest city in Vietnam. And uh, we got 500 members. The, the association account for 
15% of the furniture company in Vietnam. Last year, we uh, export turnover uh, 10 billion US dollars, ranking number five in the furniture export. And this is the furniture, furniture is a major uh, industry of Vietnam. Uh, at the beginning of the COVID-19, we uh, don't suffer because we can uh, got our uh, old material, our, our, our raw material to, to export. But until uh, the COVID come to Europe and US uh, middle of March, so we got a knockdown. But uh, even we don't got the, the buyer to receive the stock, we cannot receive the money payment. But our association made a campaign for the uh, all of the hospital, all of the temporary hospital, and within a week we collect of course a little bit of money on the uh, fifteen thousand uh, fifty thousand US dollars. But we contribute for the for the hospital and also we contribute for some of the country who got the unemployment. So. This association is uh, the we, we, we say that it, it comes from the member for the industry and for the country. And how association can be work like that? Because we got a lot of members. And I I I uh, very honored to give this time to interview about my company. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the the AA company, who I'm uh, where I'm working there as the vice director, and you saw on the picture of uh, the the slide is the uh, the picture drawn by my chairman. He very positive. He also the chairman of the association, and we give this uh, uh, we we make the 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 picture to be a picture that uh, who I wear today. And uh, until now, we don't slow down the factory. We try to contact with all of the clients, try to save all the workers. We don't uh, slow the factory. We maintain the labor force for the future development. So all the factory is still running, of course, not like uh, compared with last two, three months. This is, uh, we try to uh, keep the factory, keep the worker, and for the for the recovering later on, so worker is quite happy. Uh, all of the board director is uh, take the fifty percent of the salary off saving for the worker and for the for the staff also. So that is the three story about the country, about the association, about the company. We want to call for the responsibility of all of us because this COVID come, we cannot stay alone. We need to depend on each other. A company who work need to rely on the government and rely on the buyer. So we, I call for the responsibility of all the people and uh, this COVID will come. Uh, I, I think it uh, will be over, but uh, uh, maybe next three months, maybe next uh, six months, but with the positive thinking, uh, with the responsibility of the other people, I think we can get through this difficulty. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Fong, um, for the inspiring message. And, and uh, it was, it's great to see the emphasis on, on cooperation um, that, that you are practicing and your association is practicing. We're going to now move rapidly to our, our third mini panel. Um, we have two great speakers to, to highlight um, partnerships to curb the pandemic. Um, I'm going to flip the order and ask uh, Justin Peretson of Novozymes to speak first, followed by Miriam Sidibi. And I also just want to ask for those who haven't already discovered our very active chat box to please uh, do so for any questions or comments. Um, we have heard that we can extend our webinar by 15 minutes to take more questions and answers. So I do ask all of our panelists and speakers, those who have the time in their schedule to stay with us to plan to do so. Um, and please do record your, your comments and questions there. Um, Justin, the floor is yours, please.
Justin, can you unmute yourself, please? It appears we may have lost Justin yeah, Harrison. Yeah. Oh, wait. Hey, Justin. hey, Nari, can you hear me okay? okay? Yes, now I hear you. Right. Go ahead, please, Justin. Right. I'm, I'm going to try and speak for about three minutes to give the floor to Miriam to, to catch up a little bit of time. Um, firstly, thank you, Noreen, and the organizers for today's session. Um, I think I certainly come from a country where it was once famously said there is no such thing as society. I think if COVID has taught us anything, there is such a thing as community. And I think very much from a business perspective, the business community has really come together and try to look at the COVID-19 challenge and crisis, uh, first and foremost, in terms of addressing the immediate situation, and then trying to look forward into how that crisis can be turned into an opportunity. So specifically, I think certain things should be highlighted. And again, thank you to, to the organizers for today. This is a fantastic opportunity to also strengthen and move forward with public-private partnerships. I think you see that even within the business community itself, where a number of organizations, IOE, USCIB, Business Fights Poverty, ICC, and many others have come together and really looked at how they can bring their specific competences to the, to the issues at hand. I think that's been very, very helpful in terms of being able to not only consolidate, but also coordinate business responses so that initiatives and efforts are actually aligned with where they can make most impact on the ground. So just for example, from an Obazyme's perspective, uh, we're part of those organizations that I've just mentioned. We've tried to look across the organization at where and how we can best contribute as an industrial biotechnology company. So we've done everything from look at applying our products uh, to coronavirus diagnostic kits, uh, and I think particularly one of the areas that we've really tried to zero in on is how we can make a difference in the most vulnerable communities. In places like South Africa uh, and India in particular, we've reached out to the community and are trying to look across not only the immediate short-term challenges in terms of uh, PPE and, and protection equipment, but also how we can help food and education projects move forward. Um, the last thing I would just say in the interest of time is that Novozymes is also owned by a foundation, which itself has taken significant steps to provide uh, large amounts of funding to support COVID-19 research and also to work on how we can address some of the short-term issues such as hand sanitization and hand washing. Um, so with that, again, in the interest of time, I'm going to stop there. Um, Miriam is going to take us through some of the great work that's actually being taken forward on the ground. Um, and I will hand over to her. Uh, and again, Noreen, thank you for, for organizing today. Thank you, Justin. Um, Miriam, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining thank you. us. Thank you very much, Noreen, and thank you very much for the, the um, Justin for giving me the floor and, and for the great presentations that we've had before. I, I think it was very inspiring to see what um, you know, other businesses and, as well as uh, business networks are organizing themselves. So a little bit about my background. I'm a, I'm a senior fellow at the Musaba Rahmani Center for Business and Government at Harvard Kennedy School. I'm an assistant professor at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine as well. And, and um, you know, one of the key areas that I've spent my career over the last 20 years thinking about is the intersection, obviously, between business and government. And what can you do in terms of creating business models that can really accelerate health and well-being models? Um, and um, you know, obviously, I, I, you know, my background is in uh, prevention of infectious disease and mostly on hygiene and sanitation. So um, I have done a lot of work and thought about hand washing with soap for the last 20 years. I have to say I'm absolutely delighted to see how much focus there is on hand washing with soap. But, you know, not that it would have to take a, a full uh, global pandemic for us to get to that perspective. I think, um, you know, it, it, it's really important for us to, to keep into consideration the fact that there is um, a muscle power and, and opportunity to really tap into what businesses are doing within their core areas of, of um, you know, supplying, whether it is soap or sanitizers, and to see whether we can extend. And that is the area that I've been trying to foster as an area of work. So I've been working on what I'm calling marketing for public health, which is how do you infuse marketing with values and processes so that you can really harness um, the, all the communication channels that are being used by marketing to try to influence a lifestyle norms in a very positive manner. So if you um, 
pick up HBR this month. Um, there is a, I'm on the cover, and the cover is basically marketing meets mission. So how do you, um, uh, what are the learnings that brands have actually learned in terms of trying to tackle some of the global health challenges? And what you see in that article is ranging from gender-based violence to the last two decades learning of having um, driven the world's largest hand washing program on over 1 billion people in, in 30 countries, but also what do you do with insurances and um, such as Discovery Limited and what they're doing in terms of health promotion. Um, so I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good synopsis of my book that's coming out in about uh, two weeks' time, which is called Brands on a Mission, How to Achieve Social Impact and Business Growth for Purpose. Um, you know, I, obviously, in, in, you know, this has been the premise of my work, is how you harness business to try to respond to, to health um, challenges. And then COVID-19 hit, and I was grounded in Kenya, so I started thinking about what I could potentially do to be able to mobilize and transform this framework that I've been working on and perfecting over the last decade, um, uh, you know, to, to really say, like, what could we do to be able to accelerate local action so that we can try to curb um, uh, the pandemic? So what the output of that has been the creation of notion, the National Business Compact on COVID-19 in Kenya, which is basically a platform of collaboration for the businesses for UN family and for civil society under the leadership of the government of Kenya and the Ministry of Health. And what we've been doing is working around three uh, main axes. Is the first one is to come up with a unifying communication platform, which uh, reaches as many households as possible across Kenya to make sure that prevention mechanisms such as hand washing with soap, wearing of masks, um, and um, you know, uh, physical distancing and understanding symptoms and understanding how to reach is, is being actually trans, um, transferred by who I'm considering the masters of those, those businesses whose job it is to actually pass on communication and using their detail, their retail distribution network to be able to talk and explain and, um, and be able to distribute uh, hygiene products, which is the second axis that we've been working on. The third axis is creating a very flexible financing so that we can respond to the emergency response that government has, uh, has in terms of responding to this crisis. Now, what we're doing whilst we're learning at local level is also have a global platform of best practice sharing, which we've done with Business Fights Poverty, and you know, we support with uh, Jane Nelson from the Harvard Kennedy School. And I think what, what's been absolutely fascinating is the creation of a framework that we put together for businesses that are thinking about how to respond today, but also how to rebuild in the, in the, in the framework, to rebuild post-COVID. And what exactly would that look like for businesses where their core business can be affected or can be part of what we're talking about, or whether it is about philanthropic um, uh, gestures or whether we're talking about policy engagement, and what would the impact be from life all the way to livelihood and as well as learning, because I think in a lot of countries that we're talking about, there's a direct correlation between ensuring that prevention is well put, as well as making sure that um, uh, prevention uh, uh, livelihoods are maintained. And the two of them are gonna go very much in hand. So this platform that we've created in Kenya is learning as we go. The idea is very simple, is that we are creating a toolkit and we're sharing this to other countries. And there is an opportunity, we've managed to raise um, quite a lot of funds at the moment, um, to be able to take this learning and the same approach of this, uh, um, you know, a nationwide prevention campaign um, to other countries across uh, Africa as well. And we are planning to, to extend to uh, Uganda, Tanzania, um, uh, Rwanda, and Ghana at the moment. So there is quite a lot of opportunities and learning as we go and to create this blueprint for collaboration, which you might have seen has appeared in Forbes Africa, in CNBC, with um, you know, advisors such as Paul Pullman and David Navarro as well, part of the conversation uh, in, in where we're progressing. I think you know, there is the, whilst we need to continue thinking about um, the vaccine, in the, if we're thinking about a 12 months before we can actually get a vaccine that is possible, prevention is the only thing that's going to stop us from getting a complete um, tragedy, especially in countries like Africa and um, in countries in Africa where the healthcare system will not be able to cope. And so we need to step up at this point and think about what you're going to be able to do with the local forces on the ground to step up on prevention. And I think this model that we've created with National Business Compact 
is, an, is a really good blueprint in terms of what kind of partnerships can be done whilst we learn at global level and we deploy almost immediately in other markets. So I am really looking forward for this group to share some of the learnings that I've had, obviously having been thinking about hand washing with soap actively for the last 20 years, um, but also thinking about what you could do within this type of framework and how to encourage your members to join the, the local coalitions that we're talking about, but also ways in which we can, we can generate obviously more visibility, um, more fundraising to be able to get some of the resources there. And I think it's really important that we, 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 we acknowledge that the biggest uh, contribution that we've had has not been so much the funds. It's been about harnessing the human capital and um, the professionalism and the, and, the, and, the, and the muscle power of some of the business communities wanting to really make a difference and using that as a power of change where marketing can be the platform that you can drive real behavioral change and making sure that those partnerships are harnessing the best of core business of philanthropy as well as the, um, uh, policy engagement with a real support of the UN family endorsing what we are currently doing. So that's a little bit about what we are doing, and I'm happy to share more information. And for that, you could also go on COVID-19businessresponse.ke, which is the website which will show you the breadth of companies and commitment that we've managed to put together, as well as being able to, 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 to show the reach that we've, we've done. And in less than five weeks that this partnership has been up and running, we are now in about 45% of all households in Kenya, which is over um, 1.8 million households where the messages are being currently being talked about. And we've shared hand washing facilities and soap in you know, most of the um, government hotspots in terms of hand washing with soap and where the risk is very high. So you know, look, we're, there's a lot to learn um, and we still need to improve continuously, but I think it's an important mechanism um, that is driven by not only a coalition of a willing, but a coalition of the able. And I think that's really important to keep that, um, that conversation around the table. So thank you very much for having me today. Thank you, Miriam, and thank you to all our, our mini panelists. That was really excellent. Um, we're now going to move into our Q&A, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have been allocated some additional time just until 1045. So the way I'm going to proceed is I'm going to first call it on a colleague from um, Financing for Development on, on Tim Hilger in just a moment. Um, we have gotten many, many questions from uh, participants in this call. I'm not sure we'll be able to get all get to all of them, but we'll get to as many as we can in the time we have. And at 10.40, we're going to stop the Q&A and we're going to move into some conclusions and wind up our conversation. So with that, um, I would like to pass the floor uh, briefly to our colleague from Financing for Development, to Tim Hilger, uh, and then we'll dive into questions. Go ahead, Tim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Noreen, and all the excellent speakers so far. Uh, I'm not going to pose a question yet. I'm going to give a very brief overview about the um, Global Investors for Sustainable Development Alliance, in short, GISD. As already mentioned by ASG Elliot Harris in his opening remarks, the GISD Alliance is a strong example of the type of partnerships that are needed uh, for the timely implementation of the 2030 Agenda. This was true before the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, and it is even more so in light of the current crisis. Investments from the private sector have been falling short of the amounts that would be needed for the timely achievement of the SDGs. In response, and as part of the implementation of his strategy for financing the 2030 Agenda, the Secretary General launched the GISD Alliance in October 2019. The members are high-level private sector leaders from all over the globe that represent different sectors of the investment landscape. Just to name a few, there's Allianz Insurance from Germany, there's Bank of America, Johannesburg Stock Exchange and Investec from South Africa, Sul America from Brazil, Infosys from India, or the Japanese Government Pension Investment Fund. The overarching objective of the Alliance is to mobilize and scale up long-term investment for sustainable development. GISD is also fostering the transformation of the enabling environment, and in addition, it is facilitating the alignment of business operations, finance, and investment with the 2030 Agenda. So what does this mean in operational terms? 
All of the GISD Alliance members have designated their experts from their companies to join four working groups. Working group one is covering or is dealing with increasing the supply of long-term investment for sustainable development, what we call increasing the size of the pie. Working group two is dealing with realizing SDG investment opportunities, especially in developing countries. So moving the money where it is needed or distributing the pie. Working group three is dealing with enhancing the impact of investment, enriching the pie. And then we have a relatively new working group that covers a range of cross-cutting issues on long-term. Based on this work, the deliverables from the working groups will include actionable solutions to address industry and institutional obstacles to long-term investment. The Alliance has developed a, de a definition of sustainable development investing that we expect to be agreed upon soon. In addition, GISD is working on innovative financing instruments and vehicles to scale up investment. And of course, now the GISD members are also looking at how they can support the mobilization of resources with a special focus on the COVID-19 response and recovery. How these companies will have to position themselves in this new normal and how we can build back better. So how is the Alliance really making a difference? It is aiming to transform the way business operates through changes at the company level, at the industry level, and ultimately through an investment ecosystem transformation. Before I finish, just a few opportunities how, um, how everyone who is following this webinar can engage with the Alliance. One idea is, one suggestion is that you can engage with GISD members through your national and regional channels like business networks and associations. You can also share your analysis and ideas with us so that we can feed them into the GISD Alliance work. And finally, you can invite GISD members to your own meetings and events so that you can have a discussion with them there. This was just a very quick overview on the GISD Alliance. If you want more information, please look at the website link. Please check the website link that is uh, given on the slide in front of you. And thank you very much, Noreen and everyone. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Tim, for that uh, briefing for us. Uh, it's certainly very germane to this conversation about public-private partnerships. We need to mobilize funds. We need to uh, direct investment. And, and I think the initiative that Financing for Development has launched is a very important contribution in this regard. So we have a specific question to the Assistant Secretary General, to Elliot Harris. Harris and I'd like to begin with that one. I think his time with us is limited. Um, Mr. Assistant Secretary General, the question concerns different kinds of public-private partnerships, uh, both project-oriented partnerships and the longer-term working relationships uh, across different UN entities, private sector, and stakeholder groups. Comment on what the UN can mobilize these two types, levels of partnerships, and coordinate them as we look ahead to uh, an all of organization. I, I'm sorry, Noreen, you are you are garbling and it's coming in, fading out. I, I heard maybe 20% of, of that question. Could you repeat it, please? Okay, I'll try again. Um, and for others who have not muted themselves, please do mute yourself. Um, Elliot, the question concerned two levels of public-private partnerships, specific projects and longer ongoing collaboration. Um, and the question to you was, how can the UN uh, orchestrate and coordinate those two levels of partnership as we respond to COVID-19 and look ahead to the decade of action and delivery. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a little hesitant in using the words orchestrate and coordinate. I think facilitate is the word we need to use here. Um, and that is going to be something that has to happen at the, at the country level. The public-private partnerships are very bespoke arrangements. Uh, they depend on what the situation is and what particular issue is being addressed. And so it's very difficult to, to foresee a, a standard approach or a template. But what we can do is identify in the country, coordinator and his or her office there, what are the key priorities, what specific issue does the government need to work directly with the private sector on, and what could be the contributions of each of the partners to this joint effort. And, and I mean, the UN can definitely help there by providing inputs and expert expert um, expert opinions depending on what area we are in we have 
representatives in the UN country team of the various agencies and funds and programs of the UN, all of whom have specialized expertise. And that can be used to inform, if you will, the debate between the, the two potential partners. We can certainly set up ways in which we can provide inputs into the partnership that could support the partnership and, and the acti activities and actions to be carried out by each of the two um, partner sides. Equally important, I think, is that we in the UN can draw on the experience that we have in other countries. If there are examples of partnerships that have worked successfully in other countries in similar circumstances or addressing similar issues, we can bring that to bear in the development of the partnership with, uh, with the private sector and the government in this new country, in this new uh, particular project. Now, for the longer term collaboration, I think one, one thing that I have found to be uh, very helpful in our past, um, in, in my past experience working in countries around the world, is fostering predictability. Private sector um, investors, private sector business people find managing risk to be much more complex and difficult when the regulatory and policy framework is in constant flux. And uh, those countries that have been very successful in mobilizing uh, private sector partnerships have been the ones where the policy regulatory framework is clear and predictable and where changes to the framework are done in consultation with the private sector partners. That, in other words, it is not that one is seeking the, um, the permission of the private sector partner. It is more a question of informing the private sector of the proposed changes, what these changes mean, why they're being taken, so that there is an understanding of the direction of policy and that the thrust of that policy is consistent and predictable. I think that is one of the biggest contributions that the UN can make, is helping to facilitate that kind of steady, reliable, predictable policy framework that helps to reduce the, the perceived risk of engaging in that country. And that then, of course, encourages the private sector engagement to become much more firm, much more, again, predictable, and much more reliable going forward. And so the difference between the two is, I think, more one of a, a continuing support <clears throat> in, through the form of policy advice to building up the kind of framework within which the private entrepreneur feels <clears throat> reasonably at home, excuse me, while within which the risk is perceived as being manageable. You can't ever eradicate risk, and I personally would always advise against trying to get rid of all risk, uh, but it must, must be kept predictable and manageable in that way, and that can then encourage the kinds of partnership we're talking about. Thank you. Now, unfortunately, Noreen, I am expected at another meeting at 10.30, so I'm happy to have been able to answer this one, but I can't stay for any more. I, I do present my regrets, and I, I do hope that you continue the discussion to great effect as you go along. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot, very much for being with us for the entire 90 minutes and for that great answer. Um, let's pass on to another question um, in the remaining 10 minutes that we have before we begin to wind down. Um, there's been a question posed about the gender dimension uh, in uh, public-private partnerships to respond to COVID-19. And I think this is a good question for all of our mini panelists, if they could just speak to uh, the extent to which in their partnerships or their planning of public-private partnerships, um, how they have taken on board and reflected uh, the experience and real challenges that women are facing. So um, let's start with Miriam, if I may. Um, Miriam, could you speak a little bit to the gender dimension and then we'll call on some of the other uh, mini panelists to, to come in on this point. Miriam, the floor is yours. She may have had signed off. It looks like she she has signed off. May I ask uh, Scott if if you might be uh, able to come in on this question of reflecting and including the gender perspective? Sure. Um, thank you, Noreen, and uh, I really appreciate the question. And it's great that you and women and all the groups continue to think about the the role of gender. I've been engaged for quite some time, um, going back to the uh, every woman, every child work of. Uh, the United Nations with the Innovation Working Group, where we tried to address the uh, gender uh, issue uh, straight on. But let me just say very briefly that we know that women's education and women's role in advancement of health over the last century has made some of the biggest difference in terms of advancement in the health and well being. We need to think about that as well and have the integration throughout the whole spectrum as women 
not only as, as mothers, but also uh, women in their role in society in the workplace and so forth. So this is all meant to be inclusive. Uh, ideally, we can integrate uh, women efforts and, and gender issues throughout uh, not only the UN system, but the, the partnerships that we hope to envision with uh, business partners for sustainable developments acceleration. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, for that response, Scott. Could I call on Matinzi? Matinzi, could you reflect on the work of the IO, I, IOE and also your work in South Africa in terms of the gender dimension in the COVID-19 response? Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Noreen. I, I actually am going to approach it from two angles. Um, I think the one is not necessarily what you're asking, but I think it's important to mention it. Uh, because I was interviewed a week ago um, on issues relating to GBV, gender-based violence, um, how the crisis has actually um, increased the number of people that are being um, abused at home behind closed doors, which I think for me I'm raising here because one of the biggest elements by my host, the company called Global Citizen, was to say, why is it that men don't call out men who do these kind of things? I think for me, it's very important because it goes a lot into all the problems we have on gender and the old stereotypes and the refusal to evolve and to change and to make things different and teach our kids differently so that we can have equality and respect. And I, and I, and I, and I raise it in that respect, but secondly, I then come back to the issue that, you know, everybody agrees that women uh, tend to actually lead a lot better. I mean, I came from a call before your webinar um, where I was chairing a business human rights and responsible business uh, conduct meeting, and my keynote speaker was uh, United Nations High Commissioner uh, Michelle Bachelet, and, and she said, one of the things she said as she was signing off, was how research shows, even during this virus, that women-run companies have been run a lot, much, much, much better, a lot more effectively than any other. And, but in spite of that, somehow we still struggle to place women at the top of the agenda. And I think for me, these are some of the opportunities I was re 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 referring to in my, in my presentation that we are faced right now with a huge opportunity brought by the crisis. It has exposed all the inefficiencies in the system. It has exposed all the hypocrisy in the system. It has exposed how we need to change gears, how we need to shift, how we need to change the way we do things to be able, whether we deal with issues related to gender from a home point of view or gender from a business point of view, an agenda from a leadership point of view that we stop confusing um, people who are in positions of authority with leadership because there's a big difference. There's a lot of us men who are in positions of authority and somehow we get fooled into thinking we lead, and, but that's not leadership. And a lot of women have demonstrated that they are very, very good at showing this new kind of leadership that we need as we move into this new era. Thank you very much, Noreen. Thank you, Matunzi. Um, mindful of the time and also watching as, as some of our participants need to leave to, to take on, um, to go to other commitments they, they might have, I'm going to suggest that we move from Q&A to some concluding comments. We have received pages of, of questions and comments from all of you. Um, it demonstrates to me that there is First of all, a very clear demonstration of value of the UN system in mobilizing and encouraging partnerships and in finding ways to bring partnerships more into the mainstream of the UN's work, even more than is the case now. And we've certainly seen tremendous collaboration and, and, and openness from member states, from the UN Secretariat, um, and of course, you know, very, very keen engagement by a variety of stakeholders, including business. Um, so we, we certainly will pick up and follow up on many of the questions and comments that we've had. And it's, it's very clear that through the rest of this year, um, there is a lot more to say and more importantly to do when it comes to 
engaging the private sector and other stakeholders in partnerships and in inclusive multilateralism working with and through the UN. Um, so to be continued for sure, and I think next year's partnership forum uh, will certainly uh, be a very rich one and we'll be able to bring many of these uh, both ideas and also achievements uh, to the attention of the HLPF uh, later this year. But let's let's begin to wind down now. If we if if uh, Kevin Kuhn, who is a partner with Baker McKenzie and a member of the UN Global Compact Advisory Group on Supply Chain Sustainability, would be willing to uh, offer some comments to synthesize some of the great ideas we've heard and the takeaways that we have to follow up on uh, as we go forward to address both the COVID-19 crisis working together but more broadly, the decade of action and delivery and the agenda for 2030. So Kevin, thank you very much for joining us and for closing us out and the floor is yours. Noreen, uh, thank you very much. And uh, let me thank all the participants today for their very thoughtful and insightful contributions. Um, I, I really want to acknowledge the timely important discussion by highlighting goal 17 and its importance during this time of uh, crisis. Uh, thank you to the U.S. CIB, the IOE, UN De Department of Economic and Social Advancement, and the Business Partner for Sustainable Development for organizing this event, and the many listeners for um, uh, signing in. You know, we've heard uh, uh, through the very uh, thoughtful comments about the global pandemic presents many challenges for the implementation of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Um, as the comments indicate, though, today, uh, it also presents uh, uh, opportunities in the contents of Goal 17, which is around partnerships. And let me just make a few comments um, as to come back to the theme of this, which is around partnerships and SDG 17. Uh, and remind people about how unique Goal 17 is from the other SDGs, as it recognizes how all of the SDGs can be implemented and how it binds the SDGs together. Um, and how is that done? Well, it's through partnerships that we've heard about. And partnerships are really the glue by which the SDGs will be implemented and essential to make the agenda a reality by 2030. At its core, uh, Goal 17 is a call to strengthen the means of implementation and to build and enhance partnerships with diverse stakeholders. The view is consistent and widespread and as we've heard today, and we, we can read on social media, that such partnerships are critical to address COVID-19 and this uh, unprecedented uh, pandemic. The Secretary General of the, uh, the UN noted recently that the UN will support all governments to ensure that the global economy and the people that are served emerge stronger from the crisis. It was also noted that urgent action is needed to unlock the transformational power of the trillions of dollars of private sector resources to meet the 2030 goals and now to meet those goals in the context of COVID. And just to uh, return to some of the themes uh, that we've heard today, you know, at its core, business has the capacity and agility to meet the challenges, to innovate, develop practical and realistic solutions for the problems we face. And as, we, as we've heard today, uh, the very many examples where the private sector has and is taking a leadership role to address the pandemic, both within their own enterprises, as well as through the supply chain. And notably, in the absence of unprepared governments and the lack of a coherent and consistent public policy and public sector response. And I just want to note um, what we heard today from uh, the various examples from Charles Randolph of WIPO and the global scale and collaboration that uh, they're undertaking and uh, uh, that chart, the global chart he put on with the various connectors and how that will have to be replicated in many different aspects in terms of uh, addressing uh, COVID. Or the GSID Alliance that we just heard about and the, uh, what Nozyme is doing in terms of their uh, reaching out to vulnerable communities. And then the work that Miriam is doing in, uh, uh, in Kenya. And to Matunzi's uh, comments and other comments about 
how the response by the business community, of course, calls for uh, bespoke arrangements and uh, flexibility in dealing with a whole host range of issues. I'd like to reiterate that the private sector is ready to join forces and government with governments in the public sector, as well as the multilateral community to respond forcefully to the crisis and the needed global solidarity. We call on the UN to play a critical role to address the challenges and gaps and enhance the conditions to foster the partnerships between all governments, civil society, and business. We've heard about the need for the public sector to review, adjust frameworks, regulations, and structures, including strengthening the rule of law and the, revisiting the UN's rejection of resources from certain sectors, quite frankly, to enable the partnerships to flourish as, env as envisaged in Goal 17 and unlock the private sector resources necessary to overcome the challenges of COVID and to meet those goals. As Elliot Harris reminded us in his uh, response to a question about the need for business for predictability, for predictability in those frameworks and the regulations um, as governments make changes to, uh, to enhance the ability for the private sector partnerships to occur. Those challenges that are faced by the, uh, all of us include health, economic, social, and environmental impacts, and working more closely than ever before with business. All should be done to catalyze global resources flows of technology, resources towards economic growth, sustainability pathways, and the co-creation of integrated solutions through cooperation and partnerships at all levels. The roles and responsibilities need to be clear, the objectives needed to be defined in working with public and private sector partners, not only at the national level, but also in the UN. Good anticipatory approaches, predictability, to uh, use the term again, and coordinated impactful action are the key in this endeavor. Let me conclude with a couple of more comments. That, you know, there's a great need to catalyze resource mobilization and synergies across the COVID-19 response. The stimulus and response and prioritize the right enabling conditions to deploy private sector resources, solutions and know-how, making full use of the multilateral trade and investment, as well as domestic resource mobilization. We've been reminded time and time again on this call by the various speakers from their various vantage points about the unprecedented challenge that we are facing, about how in the 75 year history of the UN, this challenge has never been before them. The unprecedented challenge, of course, uh, to be, and not to be trite, but it calls for unprecedented cooperation and responses. It cannot be business as usual. As Dr. Scott Ratson mentioned earlier in the call, he talked about um, the research that's been done in the Edelman Trust Barometer that is showing that the voice of the business community is seen as the most trusted to workers. And that speaks really to a, a deficiency within government and other institutions. And as the credible voice is that of business, it's also an unprecedented responsibility that business has and an unprecedented expectation that business must play in terms of responding to addressing this crisis. And so with those comments, Maureen, I'd just like to conclude by saying the private sector looks forward to uh, the collaboration with the UN and the other social actors and how we can bring innovation and resources to fight this unprecedented challenge. So thank you very much to all of our guest speakers today and uh, again to the organization of this event. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for those great comments. Uh, it just remains for me to thank uh, the 
uh, organizations that we partnered with in putting this together, and let's start with the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs uh, for their excellent work um, on both substance and on making this technically possible. Um, I'd also like to thank the International Organization of Employers, Business Partners for Sustainable Development, and really I want to thank the participants who have been on the line um, from, it appears, every continent except for Antarctica uh, at whatever time of the day or night. We clearly have a tremendous pent-up demand and a lot of uh, energy to tackle the COVID-19 crisis, to do so working with the United Nations system. Indeed, we can't do it without the UN. Um, we look forward to continuing um, our dialogue with all of you and working closely across the UN system in every part of it uh, to deliver real solutions um, so that at the end of this crisis, we'll be well on our way to the 2030 agenda and well into the decade of delivery and action. So thank you all, and I'm happy to bring this uh, webinar to a close. Goodbye. Great. Bye. Thanks. Thank you, Norrin. Bye. Thank you very much, Kevin. Yeah. Hello, Kevin. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.